Hi, I'm Liv, and welcome back to the book nook. I'm saying that different. Hi, I'm Liv, and welcome back to the book nook. I'm saying it different. So today's video is going to be my August part one wrap up. Now, this morning, just before I started recording, I finished my 100th book of the year. Yay! And let's see if I can find, see if it's still going on Goodreads when you finish your reading challenge for the year. Yeah, there it is. Wait. It's confetti. Confetti. But let's start at the beginning because I've heard that that's a very good place to start. So the beginning of the month, I wasn't feeling too well. I had a horrible cold. Horrible cold. Don't know why it came out like that. So I wasn't feeling too well. So I took to my chair with a blanket and a stack of graphic novels and just spent some time looking after myself. And the first of those graphic novels was Tom Gold's Moon Cop. And I absolutely loved this. It was absolutely adorable. The illustrations, you may remember I showed you some of the illustrations when I hauled this one, but they're just absolutely adorable. And Tom Gold is a cartoonist who, um, he does cartoons for, is it the, yeah, Guardian and New Scientist. And um, they're just sort of really touching and, and sweet. And it's a little graphic novel about a version of the future where humans have settled on the moon and there are settlements on the moon. There's sort of a bit of an infrastructure up there. And people have ended up using the moon as like a holiday destination and moon living, the sort of shine of that has, has rubbed off. But um, there is a moon cop, they still have to have a police force. And moon cop goes around policing the streets of the moon, the craters. And um, yeah, you meet some of the characters. But it's a sort of, it's really sort of melancholic because essentially there's hardly anybody there and he doesn't have a lot to do and he's quite sort of alone. Um, but then the ending is really sweet, so I urge you to, to pick this one up. It's not going to take you very long at all, but there's a lot in there. And this is definitely one that I'm going to go to when I'm feeling a bit sort of... Hmm, bit blue. Might go for the Moon Cop. But yeah, Moon Cop by Tom Gold. It's a really sweet little one. I love his illustrations. He's always got this right mix of kind of sweet and funny and quite wry and telling as well. So um, Tom Gold's Moon Cop, I urge you to check out some of Tom Gold's illustrations as well for The Guardian and New Scientist, um, because you will love them. Speaking of gorgeous illustrations, the next one I read was Moonhead and the Music Machine by Andrew Ray. This is a no-brow uh, graphic novel. Now, I picked this one up on the strength of the illustrations. I'm not going to lie. It seemed like a cool story, um, but it was the illustrations that really sold it to me. And they are, let's see if I can find some of the uh, full page ones. Of course, I'm not going to. Of course, I'm not going to. You know, things like this. They are really, really gorgeous illustrations. And the sort of drawings of characters and faces are really good as well. Um, so the story is essentially about Joey Moonhead, and he's a total normal kid in every way apart from the fact that he has a moon for a head. So his family has moons for heads. Don't know why. And he is a bit of a dreamer. He doesn't really sort of pay attention in school until he meets Ghost Boy, and he signs up for the talent show to play a music machine, and he invents his own music machine. Now, I really wanted to love, 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 love this graphic novel. And I didn't dislike it but it just left me feeling a little bit cold for all of its gorgeous illustrations and its nice message of you know do your own thing don't be afraid to be you you will find your people which you know is a, is a good message there was just something about it that just left me a little bit cold and I don't quite know what it was and it's really frustrating because as I say I wanted to love it but I don't know there was just something about it that left me a little bit colder than I would have liked as I say, the message is sound. Illustrations are absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's a nice object. It's got a nice heft to it. But yes, yeah, something about it just left me a little bit cold. Um, but I think it is one, you know, worth reading, you know, but um, yeah, it wasn't 100% sold on this one. Then the next graphic novel that I read, because as I say, I was having a bit of a graphic novel binge, is Deadly Class. Reagan Youth, and this is by Rick Remender and some other people. Where's Craig and Lee Loughridge? Now, I picked this one up a little while ago because Amy over at Shout Amy uh, was raving about this series, and I was sold on the front cover alone. It looks super cool. And I read it, and I really don't know what I think about this one. It's dark. It's about a group of teenagers who go to a school for assassins. The King's Dominion Atelier of the Deadly Arts, a brutal clandestine high school where the world's top crime family send the next generation of assassins to be trained. And we are sort of ushered into this world by Marcus, who is a homeless kid who obviously has a bit of a past and there are sort of hints to it and a little bit more of it is revealed as we go along. And he's as he sort of makes friends, 
not fully sort of like trustworthy friends and things in this school and then they go off on some sort of assignments and things get weird and very very dark it goes on like a super strong LSD trip and there's a lot of murder there's a lot of it's very nihilistic and it's quite brutal and I think I love it but I think it's going to be one where I need another couple of volumes to fully decide how I feel about it but it is brilliantly dark but there are a couple of bits that I'm not entirely sold on some of the character dynamics I'm a little bit mm, but overall a solid first volume I think and um, I'm not gonna rush to get volume two because I want to read more Lumberjanes before I read this I think but actually I think maybe they'd be quite a good balance to each other the light and fluff and loveliness of Lumberjanes against the absolute nihilistic brutality head f of deadly class so then the next graphic novel that I read is one that I was very excited about. And it is one of two graphic novels that I got this month, didn't wait to haul and just read them before I hauled them, but I've now since hauled them. So the first one of these is Paper Girls Volume 3 by Vic Bra <laughs> Brian K. Vaughan and Cliff Chiang. Now, I love these graphic novels, but as I said in my haul for it, when I, like, talking about when I read it, I haven't got a sodding clue what's going on. I'm so confused with the timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff. And I should have reread volumes one and two and then sat and read this. I should have read all three, you know, taken a couple of hours and sat and read all three. But I didn't. I dove straight into this one and, yeah, thoroughly confused. I mean, it, it's bloody brilliant, don't get me wrong. Characters are cool, everything's just really cool and dark and, yeah, atmospheric. And But I just don't know what's going on. I th definitely before volume four comes out I'm going to have to sit and reread them and maybe talk to some other people who have read them and try and get my head wrapped around it. what the hell is going on. The main thing is that the dynamic between the four girls that are the main characters is so solid and so sort of refreshing um, and just really enjoyable to read all the other stuff around it even if you don't quite know what's going on like I do doesn't really matter so much because the main dynamic between these four girls is what's important and their sort of growth and their journey. So yeah, Paper Girls Volume 3 by Brian K. Vaughan and Cliff Chang. If you're enjoying the series so far, definitely pick it up. It will probably make more sense to you than it does to me. But again, illustrations are just houses, colour palette, amazing. And yeah, the four girls, the main characters, the sort of dynamic is just brilliant. Speaking of a great dynamic between main female characters, the next graphic novel I read is Giant Days Volume 5. And you will all know by now how much I love Giant Days. And if this one... Okay, so if I didn't love it enough already, if I didn't love Giant Days enough already, the three main characters, the humour, the, the the friendship, the sweetness, the dynamic, the growth that they're all going through, the, the nostalgia that it evokes for like first year of uni, if I didn't love it enough for all of that, Volume 5 okay has a whole scene scene section of a chapter where they've moved into their student home so in this volume they've finished first year they're not freshers anymore and they're moving into their home for second year and it has a whole section on ikea yes brilliant. say a whole section it's like four pages of them going to ikea one of them's never been to ikea before and um isn't sort of sold on the magic that is ikea and the others take them to ikea and they do the thing that I think everybody does when you go to Ikea, where you walk around the show homes and you pretend, well, this is my house. And it's like, okay, so who would I be if I live in this house? And yeah, just absolutely. And the, the picture on the back is is when um, Esther realizes how much, <laughs> how amazing Ikea is. So yeah, as if I didn't love it enough a whole bit on Ikea. I mean, it's the perfect graphic novel for me, really. Um, I should say it's by John Allison and it's illustrated by a few people, uh, Max Sarah and Liz Fleming. And um, I just, I bloody love these graphic novels, I really do. There is something so oh, just lovable about them. As I say, it encapsulates this kind of the fears and the nervousness and figuring out who the hell you are in your sort of first year of uni. And I'm really excited to see where it goes with the, with the second year of uni and what the characters get up to. So yeah, really, really love this one. So that's it for graphic novels this month. As I say, I read a few uh, at the beginning of the month. Hey, so this is Later Live just popping up because I got to this point in my video and got too excited and rambled on for a lot longer 
about the next two books than even I realised I had done. To the point where I filled up my memory card, that should have been a clue. But um, yeah, I talked too much about them and my video was heading towards like half an hour, which I'm not gonna impose on anyone. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a little recappy bit, well, recappy for me, but not for you, about the two books that I ramble on about, and then I will post separately, not too long, just, you know, maybe a couple of hours, maybe the next day, the actual longer sort of reviews, mini reviews that it turned into about these two books. So the first one, well, I should say, so the next book I read this month was um, Reservoir 13 by John McGregor. Now, I'm a huge fan of John McGregor. I loved um, If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things and his short story collection. This isn't the kind of thing that happens to someone like you. Um, I'm not gonna go into as much depth and it feels really weird doing this again a couple of hours on from when I already spoke about this book. But essentially, this is a book that explores a small village in the north-ish of England um, where a young girl goes missing around about Christmas and New Year's and this book then follows the village as it moves on from that event and the ramifications of that on a small village and I really enjoyed this book I don't think it quite hits the the heady heights of If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things for me but it does similar things in examining a community um, but a slightly different type of community and again the review video will go into this in a bit more depth but suffice to say Reservoir 13 by John McGregor is a really solid novel There's some really quite moving stuff in there his writing is absolutely beautiful um, and yeah I didn't love it as much as If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things but I've only read two of his novels um, If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things is one of my favourite novels of all time because of the things it does and I'm a huge fan of his short story collection this isn't the sort of thing to happen to someone like you um, but this is a really solid addition to John McGregor's uh, list of novels, his his canon of, of writing, um, and I think it was something really beautiful. Um, but yeah, more thoughts about this in my longer review type video for this and the next book, which I will post probably tomorrow. So the next book that I read this month is my 99th book of the year, um, which I mentioned that I was reading, I think, in my last video. I forgot what I said earlier when I filmed this uh, earlier, so I just, I'm, I'm a mess. So my 99th book of the year is Solar Bones by Mike McCormack. Now this won the Goldsmiths Prize earlier on, was it earlier on this year or late last year? I can't remember now, I'm getting my calendar confused. And is currently on the long list for the Man Booker Prize. So after I finished Reservoir 13, I thought, okay, I'm gonna carry on reading the Man Booker long listed books that I own. So I cracked on with Solar Bones. Now, Solar Bones is a novel written in one continuous sentence. Now, one of the things that I do say in my review that I am going to say here quickly is that people have asked me if it's a bit wanky and pretentious, and the answer is yes and no. I like a bit of pretentiousness when it comes to reinventing the form, and uh, th there's something about it that I absolutely love. It's an incredibly intense book. It says a lot in 250-ish pages. It's huge compared to its actual size. It's got heart, it's got soul, it's got guts, it's got... A hell of a lot in there it's it's the story of one man's life rec recounted over an hour but there are things about it that i don't want to say here because i do actually want this to be a little bit more spoiler free which i will yeah you will notice in the review video i tried to get around that when i thought i was recording it for my wrap-up but yeah for a 250 ish page book it is absolutely huge there is so much packed in there i think if you are a fan of Amy mcbride you will love this um, there were shades for me of Sarah Moss's The Tidal Zone as well because it is the voice of a father examining his life, his marriage, his, his relationship with his children. This book had a real impact on me is what I will say um, and I'm not going to go into it here because I've already done it once today and it will be in the, the longer review but this book had a real, real impact on me. Um, there's something about the writing so incredibly powerful. I'm angry at myself that I didn't get around to reading this sooner. Again, as I mentioned in my review, I have got a copy of this, um, the original copy when Tramp Press, uh, an Irish publisher, published it. And I didn't get around to reading it then. And I'm annoyed at myself. So Solar Bones by Mike McCormack is an incredible book for me. It's an absolutely wondrous thing. Um, but as I say, I will post shortly, very shortly, as I say, because I'm going to have it ready, my two more in-depth reviews of Reservoir 13 and Solar Bones. So, as you may remember from my last video, which was my August part one haul, Solar Bones by Mike McCormack was my 99th book of the year. 99th book of the year on the shelf. See, remembered it. So that was my 99th book of the year, and in my last video, I mentioned that I had chosen my 100th book of the year to be Tom Hanks, Uncommon Type. So it's a collection of short stories by Tom Hanks, the actor. Have you heard of him? You probably have. And I was very kindly sent a proof of this uh, by William Heinemann, uh, a couple of weeks ago and yeah I sat and read this one finished it this morning and it's lovely 
it's lovely guys i'm very happy to report it's lovely it was one when i read the first couple of stories i was a little bit kind of um unsure a little bit kind of like oh is this gonna disappoint oh this will be a shame but it doesn't it's an adjustment period there is always for me a slight adjustment whenever any kind of celebrity has branched out into the world of fiction there's always a bit of an adjustment period. I think subconsciously you're thinking, okay, this is this is my world, okay? Books is my world. You're coming in, you better be good. You better know what you're doing. You better not be too, you know, be careful here. So the first, well, for me anyway. So the first couple of stories, I was a little bit kind of, okay, right, getting used to it. But actually, it's thoroughly charming, a lot of the stories. My favorite bits in here, so you've got some regular short stories and then you've got Our Town Today with Hank Fisett. And it's these little sort of newspaper columns by a guy in a local newspaper. And they're really sort of funny and sweet and they kind of seem to sum up this small town, small American town sensibility. Um, there's one where this guy goes to New York um, for a short while and he's comparing everything in New York to this small town. He's going like, oh yeah, this is great, but have you been to this restaurant? And it's just, it's really, really charming. And there are some stories in there that are stronger than others. But Tom Hanks, I'm really impressed with the array of voices that he does. And there's one um, sort of set of characters that he keeps returning to. Yeah, I can't remember if we actually know the main guy's name, but there's him and his three friends, Anna, Steve and M Dash. And um, he returns to those characters uh, three times in the collection. Um, the first one is the, one of the very first stories and that's where I was a little bit unsure about the voice because it was from the perspective of this, this guy who's a bit of a lazy guy and he, he starts going out with a friend of his where they sleep together and then she kind of steamrolls him into a bit of a relationship and she's quite sort of, she's intense. Um, and I was slightly worried about where it was potentially gonna go but actually it didn't go where I was worried it was gonna go. And when we return to these characters, you know, there's sort of one slap bang in the middle and then the last one is these characters again. And actually, it was, again, it was really charming and the way he sort of shaped these characters over the space of these three stories. But the three, the one in the middle was a bit more of an audible one and I like that. He went a little bit odd. It was one where the four friends just decide to go to the moon. They decide to fly around the moon. And it's just, it's plotted as completely plausible that they can just build a rocket and just go around the moon. And they can take their iPads up and everything. And it was just totally oddball. There is something about this. There is something of the George Saunders about this. And I didn't expect to be saying that. Some Yeah, I didn't expect to be saying that. You guys know how much I love George Saunders and his short fiction. And there is something of that in this in that there is something in each story that's just slightly, hmm, okay. And I know you could say that of most short stories and that for me is the power and the, the beauty of short stories is that you can go with reality and just go tweak. But I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it was the Americanness, the, you know, it, it's a, he's a white middle class male, uh, American male, um, who has a lot of life experience. Maybe, maybe that's the similarity. I don't know, but there was something in it that just slightly reminded me of George Saunders and that was a welcome thing, surprising, but welcome. And as I say, the array of voices in here and he flips between, you know, older older characters and older sort of time periods to, to modern, more futuristic things. And I was quite impressed. As I say, always a bit of a worry. Um, was a little bit nervous, but yeah, actually really, really gorgeous all of the voices in here and the characters as I say there's just something slightly off balance that you're like okay all right but at the same time there are some really lovely scenes in there there's um it felt very american i think is 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 the main thing very american but that's expected it's tom hanks he's about as american as you get so and for me um so the conceit of this or not the conceit of this but what the theme of this is is typewriters tom hanks has a huge typewriter collection and he's an aficionado a bit of an expert and all of these stories have a typewriter in them in some capacity be it the main driving force of the story or just mentioned now the ones where it's just mentioned i can see how if these stories were you know published in magazines you know every now and again a little smattering in there a little mention of a typewriter that's quite cute in one go sometimes you're like okay you just shoehorn that in there didn't you but then sometimes there are quite you, you get most of the way through a story and you're like hey there's not been a typewriter and then somebody goes up to the attic and just moves aside a typewriter and you're like there it is and it's just sweet but for me my favorite in here and 
it's probably not a surprise that it's my favourite. Um, and I'd heard that it was one in here and I was waiting for it. And I'm just trying to find it because I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's called These Are The Meditations Of My Heart. And it is about a girl who, um, she's gone through a breakup and she's decided to live her life a little bit more minimalist. But then she is walking around a, a, a sort of flea market type boot sale type thing. And she comes across a typewriter and it's only five bucks. So she buys it. And then she gets it home and it doesn't work particularly well. Um, so she takes it into a shop where they say they re repair typewriters and the guy's like, yeah, this is this is a toy. This isn't a real typewriter. Um, there is there is more to it than this. I'm simplifying drastically. But what I love is, so then this guy has got loads of typewriters on display for sale, you know, proper, proper typewriters. And the knowledge of the typewriters that Tom Hanks has really bleeds through in this one. And you could read it as a guy showing off about how much he knows about typewriters. But it's just so bloody charming. That's Tom Hanks all over, isn't it, really? But he manages to, to make it sound not horrible. So he's got, um, he brings down a Remington 7 noiseless and that's my dream typewriter, absolutely. And she, she tries on that one. And then there's a, a Royal, a Safari portable. And then for me, the thing that I love the most in that particular story is that the typewriter that she ends up buying is a Hermes 2000 in seafoam green portable, which I have the baby version of. <laughs> so for me, it was, I'm gonna put this down square. And it stinks, it needs some work, I've cleaned it out, but it smells like poo, like actual, I think an animal did a doo-doo in there, but I've cleaned it. Anyway, um, I have the baby version of that. I've put it on top of the book, I'm gonna rescue it. So I have the baby version of the typewriter that she gets um, in that story in the same colour and it was just, I was reading it, I was like, I got a Hermes baby, she's got the big, and it was just, yeah, a bit of fangirling over typewriters because I'm clever. So yeah, that was just a, a little moment in there that I was like, yay! There is something so charming about this book. Yeah, I was dubious to start with, I was a bit, well, I was excited to start with, I was so excited to start with. Then I started reading it and I was a bit like, don't let me down, Tom, don't let me down, Tom. But he didn't. It's very charming, very American. There are some references in there that don't quite mean as much to me, but will to American readers and American audiences. The early kind of dubiousness evaporated um, within the first few stories. There are some stories that I love in there more than others. As I say, These Are the Meditations of My Heart was gorgeous. Um, the last story in the collection, actually, Steve Wong is Perfect, was actually uh, one that I really, really enjoyed. Um, and Stay With Us, which as I say is the one that set out like a screenplay, I absolutely loved. And all the Hank Fisett Our Town Today ones were just uh, really, really charming. So charming is the buzzword for this one that um, I would definitely use. So yeah, I'm really excited for when this one comes out in October. Um, we're hopefully going to have our new, lovely, shiny, new refitted store at work. And I'm going to make sure we get something thin. And uh, we've got a typewriter prop somewhere at work, so... Uh, might be doing some windows and stuff for this one. But yeah, Tom Hanks, Uncommon Type. My 100th book of the year was a right charmer. Thanks, Tom. So those are the books that I've read so far in August. And they are my 100th book of the year and a few before it. That's how maths works. So yeah, 100 books of the year so far. I'm really chuffed with that. Um, and as I said in my last video, I'm going to set my target now for 150 for the year. I would love to make it 200. If I read pretty much exclusively graphic novels and short novels, I could definitely do that. Um, but there are a few books, as I say, that I've got to read, well, I've got to read, but want to read, but have to read uh, for book clubs and things. And yeah, some, some slightly chunkier books that I do want to get through. Plus Christmas is coming up. I hate to start talking about Christmas when it's only August, but I work in retail. We have to start thinking ahead. So we've got this huge refit coming up and then we've got Christmas. So that's always a mad, 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 mad time. So I don't see myself reading another 100 books between now and December 31st. So uh, another 50 books between now and December 31st and I'll be happy. So 150 books is my reading challenge for 2017. Like I said in the last video, do you have a challenge? Is that something you do? Do you just keep track? Um, how's that going for you? So yeah, that is my August wrap up part um, one, uno. And my 100th book of the year. I don't know how to say 100 in any other language. Cent, what, Cent centurion. Oh, I'm thick. Anyway, 
100 of the buggers. I've done them. I've read them this year and I'm happy with that. So I'm going to go and read some more. What are you reading at the moment? Have you read any of these that I have just read? What here? Are you reading any of the Man Booker Long List? Are you enjoying any of them? Loving any of them? Hating of them? Do you hate literary prizes altogether and want nothing more to do with it and won't read a book? Should it ever be mentioned on a long list? I don't know. Tell me more about yourself. Yep, tell me about what you're reading. Have a little chat in the comments below and I will see you in my next video, which I still haven't decided on, but I will be filming on Monday. Bye! Okay, I'm gonna do a more normal goodbye now. I don't know what that was. Thanks very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That wasn't much more normal, was it?